The Cavalcade of America, presented by DuPont. The speed of airplanes and the speed of ocean liners, the speed of express trains and the speed of automobiles, the speed of the telegraph, the telephone, the radio... All the flashing dynamic force in modern communication and transportation is part of the American heritage of foresight and enterprise. One of the most thrilling manifestations of this heritage occurred about the middle of the last century when, captained by young men, the American clipper ships carried the American flag, American commerce and ideas to every port in the seven seas. Overture, Don Burry's and the DuPont Cavalcade Orchestra play a special setting of the hit tune, Deep Purple. The story begins one evening about 1855 in an old house on the main coast. Whale oil lamps shed a mellow light over the room, throwing into sharp relief the carved walrus tusks and coconut shells on the whatnot, catching the color of a Spanish shawl on the back of a chair, revealing a faded Indian print slung over a sea chest in the corner. Nine o'clock, Peter. Where do you suppose Josiah is? Probably down at the dock. He should have sailed with the tide this evening, Martha. I can't see any reason for delaying any longer. Yes, I must have had good reasons. Maybe. He's so young, Peter. He's 22. I took my first ship out when I was 20. Well. Good evening, Mother. Good evening, Father. Father. We're not cutting over the stores. That ship's as trim as a mackerel. 
Why didn't you sail with the evening tide, son? Emily wasn't ready. A few hours wouldn't matter anyway. Time always matters in the China trade. Time is money. This is your first voyage as a master, son. Time you learned. I know, but Emily had a few things to do before we sailed. We're ready now. We'll get underway bright and early tomorrow. All right. But remember, Josiah, you've got to beat the flying scud. Yes. The Williams boat. Good ship. Maybe. But you've got to make a better passage. You can't afford to let her beat you to Hong Kong. She'll have the first choice of market there. And if she makes a faster passage home, she'll do the same here. We can't afford to let that happen. Is there any uh, special reason why? I mean, aside from our investment. Well, yes, there is, sort of. Mm-hmm, I thought so. I, uh, I bragged about you, son. Oh, I guess you bragged to Williams. Well, how much did you bet I'd make a faster passage out and home than his flying scud? Come, Father. How much? Ten thousand dollars. Ten thousand? Peter, why? Now wait, Mother. Father, my share in the Stars and Stripes is worth more than ten thousand. Yes, I know it is. But what of it? I'll just take half that bet. Next morning, as the sun rose out of the sea, and the harbor of the little main town sparkled in a lacy coverlet of white caps, on the quarter deck of the stately clipper ship stands the young captain. Aye, sir. Very well, Mr. Jones. Our bank's on. Get underway. Aye, sir. Now then, boys, keep away on the wind that breaks and strike a light. Shut her in an old graveyard. through the fretting waters of the harbor, the stars and stripes with billowing sails, slides out to sea and down the Atlantic coast. Its sleek black hull, its pine decks, holy stone to dazzling white, its fife rails, stanchions, and cabin of mahogany, brass, and rosewood gleamed in the morning sunlight. And as the days pass... I wonder where the flying scud is now. I hope she's leagues behind us, Emily. Remember when we shot at her a week ago? We were ahead of her then. Now that we lost her... Can't tell. Look, sir. Ah, oh, there you little devil. I'm going to make a seaman out of you. I have to take a rope down to do it. Come along here. <laughs> it's the bosom of the ship's boy. He's got him by the neck. What's he doing, Jack? Oh, just teaching him the ropes, I guess. He won't hurt him. Ah, Mr. Bosom, let go my neck. Ah, you're breaking it. That's why I get for having such a scrawny neck. Now, name the sails beginning at the top. Uh, sky so, royal, top so, and top so. And, and on the foremast, it's the foresail. And on the mainmast, it's the mainsail. But on the mizzen, it's the spanker. Why is that, sir? What do you carry after yourself, you landlocked weasel? Oh! Name the sails and the bowsprit. Ah, uh, uh, flying jib, outer jib, and inner jib, sir. Aye. Okay. What comes between the bow and the foremast? Ah, uh, 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 the foretop and the Trick me, I was going to have you boys for supper if you missed that one. Get down with you before I change me my... Wait a minute. Say your catechism before you go. Lively now. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thou art able. And on the seventh... Holy on the decks and scrape the cable. Call me a Portuguese, but I'll make a steamer out of you yet. Aye, aye, sir. He'll make you a good hand, Bosun. Yeah, smart boy, Captain. Sharp as a piper note. Bosun, how do you make that boy remember all that? Uh, well, ma'am, you might say that's where the spanker comes in. Days of white sails and flying clouds with gusts of salt spray fanning in sheets of sunlit mist off the great prow of the clipper ship. Nights in tropic waters, when its towering mass seemed to rake through the low torch-like stars. And the wind sang over the sea as the jib boom creaked with the roll of the waves. Then gray days and wild nights, ice and snow and fog. 
As the clipper careened to the west, as it swept around the bottom of the western hemisphere, as it rounded the horn. One day in the captain's cabin... That's your daily concert, Captain Blake. Was on board us the very dreadful of it. No. Not when they you. Josh, what a very pretty speech. I thank you, sir. If your ship were a little more steady, I could. <laughs> I'm proud of you, Emily. Running the horns, not easy. I wonder if we're here before the flying scud. Don't wonder about it, Josh. We can't know anyway until we get to Hong Kong. Darling. Yes. You're sure you're making it all right? Oh, of course I am, Josh. And then it'll be warmer soon, won't it? You bet it will. Too warm. When we start to beat up north with the Pacific, you will wish you had some of this ice aboard. It's easy enough for me, but sometimes I think of the men. making sail when the sheets are still with ice. The bloody fingers. I've seen them. Well, it's their life. They chose it. And it's their duty. You've been hearing things, Emily? A little. Don't pay attention to it. Yes? Come in, Mr. Jones. Well, what are you doing here? What's that you got behind you? Well, come, speak up. Sir, go to the boy. Tommy, speak your piece. Please, sir. I, uh, I was in one of the upper bunks in the forecastle, and I heard the men... The men... Talk, Tadpole, talk! Well, sir, it's the grub. Say vittles to Captain Blake. Let him alone, Mr. Jones. What about the grub, Tommy? They say it's bad. Oh, bad is it? Sir, if you give them angel cake, they'd expect wings. Please, sir... They're sending a deputation. A deputation? Some sea lawyer put them up to that, all right. You've done your duty, Tommy. You stay here with Mrs. Blake. Mr. Jones, you come with me. Aye, sir. Oh, Josh, you may need this. Here, take it. No, Emily. I don't need a pistol. When I can't handle a crew with my bare hands, I'll quit. And take to growing cabbages. Come, Mr. Jones. We'll go on deck. Let me get a marlin spike. Be quiet. Now, men, what's this I hear about a deputation? Come on. Speak up, Joe Brown. I've had an eye on you, my lad. Well, sir, as long as I'm the one that's going to be picked on, I will speak up. Sir, the grub's rot. The meat smells so we can hardly eat it. And the biscuit's full of worms. That kind of food ain't fit for no Christian. The rest of you men feel this way? Like Brown here? The grub's rotten. The cabin gets what decent food's aboard. You mealy mouse sea lawyer, that's a lie. I pay for the cabin food out of my own pocket. And that's my business. I got a right to say what I please. Right? Right? You're a pretty seaman to talk a right. You're a rotten bully, you pampered scut. <coughs> say that again. I won't. You've struck me. I'll have the law on you in the first port. Good. I'll make it worth your while. But as long as I'm in command of this ship, I'm the law, and you all know it. Onward and up through the blue Pacific sped the great ship, full sail before the wind. Under clear skies and the brilliance of warm sunlight, week after week slipped by. But one afternoon... We're almost at the China coast, Emily. Why don't you answer? What's the matter, girl? I don't know, Josh. It's just these last few days. Maybe it's the heat. Say, the sun's so hot here by the rail, and yet it's pale, not bright. I know. It's bad. I don't much like it. It's oily sea. Oh, it's like a strip of silk waving and shimmering. And there isn't any air I can't breathe. I don't like those cloud banks to the north. They seem almost alive. They look like some great mountain. Go below, Emily. I'll join you when I can. But it's so hot below. Obey your skipper, girl. There's reason for it. I know there is. I'll go. Mr. Jones? Aye, sir. Take in sail. Keep enough aloft for steerage way. Aye, sir. Boatswain, pipe all hands on deck to take in sail. Jump to it, lively. Think it's a hurricane, sir? Looks like it. Night time, right place. Just our luck to run into a hurricane when we're trying to beat the flying scud. Keep a sharp eye, Mr. Jones. I'm going below for a moment. Aye, sir. Here, you shantyman. Strike a light. Hands for the halyards. Top gallant sails. Stand by to reef top sails. Ma'am? What's the matter? I'm afraid. The 
to be coming from. Soon, Josh, very soon. Oh, don't be afraid, darling. Doing all I can. I can't go in it, Casta. Here, let me fix a pillow behind your head. Don't leave me, Josh. Right. Uh, we're in for it. I've got to go on deck. Sorry, hold me, Patty. No, sure, I've got to go. Now leave me on deck. I need you here, especially now. No, no, Emily, I, I must, I tell you. Oh, darling, and couldn't you say a prayer with me before you go? We, we come a pray in people. Emily, the ship, you, everybody is in my hand, and I'm in God's hand. You pray. Pray for all of us. <laughs> and shivered in the driving gale, the clipper ship plowed its way through the slashing sea toward the China coast. Overhead, the dark skies roared, ignited by streaking lightning, and the wind howled through the shrouds of its swaying mass. Late that night, the hurricane subsided. And some days later... Feel a little better, Emily? So warm and calm, I thought the air on deck might do you good. Where is he? Fast asleep in that little crib you made in the cabin. Oh, Josh, he's so sweet. I'll bet he's just as stubborn as you are. <laughs> we should be seeing China or Port most any time now. Just for a while, I'm tired of the sea, the wind, the waves. It's so relentless, so impersonal. Land ho! Land ho! Well, I'm going off the port bow. Look, Emily. It almost looks like fog way off the port. That's land. That's China, darling. Slowly, the great clipper ship flew toward the South China coast with its granite rocks and broken shorelines and into the tropical harbor of Hong Kong. Here at last, the stars and stripes slipped quietly and dropped anchor. Josiah Blake and his wife, carrying their baby, go ashore immediately to the noisy hubbub of the dock, jammed with an excited, clamorous throng. This way, Emily. Come on. Don't let go my hand. I won't, Jack. Darling. Captain Blake! Captain Blake! Hi, Mr. Hall. Over here. Uh, there you are. Mighty glad to see you, Captain. Have a good boy. One hurricane, that's all. Hey, but tell me. Has the flying scud come in yet? Haven't seen sight of her. She's not due yet. Then we've won the first lap, haven't we? Oh, yes. Oh, uh, I'm sorry, Mr. Hall. Now, this is my wife. How do you, Mom? And our baby, too. He was born at sea, Mr. Hall. Well, I hope he'll make as good a skipper as his father. Certainly had a good start. I hope we can find a missing somewhere. We've got to have the baby back time. Well, that'll come later, Emily. First, I've got to get over to the market. I'm going at once. You are not. You're going to bring your wife up to my house. I want you to be my guest while you're in Hong Kong. Well, we can't stay long. We've got to be heading back to the States. Emily, uh, you can go ahead with Mr. Hall. I'll come right over from market. Now, Mr. Hall, would you please have the office? Within a few days, the hold filled with cargo exchanged in the markets of Hong Kong, the American clipper again weighed anchor for the homeward voyage. But first... Soft, wondrous tropic nights and the long, listless days. Until the gale and ice of Cape Horn lashed the deck and the stars and stripes pointed its bowsprit north. Then again up through the blue rolling waters of the southern Atlantic. And when the red sun tipped the western horizon, then were tall tales told by the seamen who gathered to watch Emily rock our baby in a tiny hammock. You sure is a fine lad, that baby, ma'am. Well, he's crossed the line once already. Now wait till he sees the sea serpent. The sea serpent? Mm. Did you ever see him, Bolton? Oh, ma'am. And did I not? It was 20 years ago, a week on this Thursday, when I was able to see him on the conquest, running a switch New York and Liverpool. Well, ma'am, just off the Azores. Oh, it was a starry night, and I was on the watch. 
I smell the curious smell. Oh, what was it like? Well, one might say, ma'am, that it was a sort of a mixture. A mixture of elephant and whale. And then what happened? Well, it was off the starboard bow. And when it looks, they see a great head rising in the moon. Two horns it had, and a neck as long as our mainmast. Well, I rubbed my eyes, and then I see the rest of them. A rippling and a floating out behind for half a mile or more. Ah, oh, ma'am, it was handsome. But uh, weren't you frightened? Ma'am, I'll be truthful. I was uneasy. On it comes nearer and nearer with its great mouth wide open. I was the only one of the crew on deck, except him at the wheel. And I knew that one of us was lost. The serpent was hungry. Else why would he come up from his home in the great deep, except to look for food? Oh, there, there. Go back to sleep, darling. But, Thorsten, what did you do? Well, just swing the little hammock gently, ma'am. That's it. Ah, he's doing nicely now. What did I do? Oh, yes, yes. I takes the wheel myself. And I says to the man with hazard, Timmy says, I go into the moonlight by the starboard rail and tell me what you see. Why did you do that, Thorsten? Oh, ma'am. This Jimmy was a fearful, ugly man. Monkey Face Jim, they called him. And it was an insult to any self-respecting monkey. Thinks I, one look at Jimmy, and that there serpent will lose his appetite. And did he? Ma'am, I'll be frank and truthful. He did. One look at Jimmy did that serpent give, and then he let out a dreadful moan, put his head under the water, and sinks himself down. And you never saw it again, though? No, ma'am. I wouldn't try to deceive you. I did not. Oh, here comes the skipper. I'll be going along, ma'am. Rosen been spinning yarns to you and the baby, Emily? Yes, yeah, all about the sea serpent. And monkey face Jimmy? Oh, I know that one. <laughs> the bosun's full of yarn. Oh, 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 I found all day, Mr. Jones. Right, sir. Pass the word around. There'll be an extra bonus for every man on board. If we leave the flying scud so far as turn, she doesn't sight us before we make port. It was nip and tuck between the two great American clipper ships as they raced across the rolling seas back to Maine. And it was a thrilling spectacle of expert seamanship and beautiful vessels that characterized this romantic era in our maritime history. Finally, late one afternoon, as the steeple bells pealed over the little main harbor, the two stately greyhounds of the ocean, with their white sails arched in the wind, hove into sight. But it was Captain Blake on the Stars and Stripes that came first into port. Good work, Josiah. Fine. I'm proud of you, boy. Proud as a pig with two tails. Ninety days out and eighty-eight days return. Got a fine cargo, too, Father. And you, Emily. You and Josiah had to go beyond that. Made a couple of grandparents out of us. <laughs> Look, Martha, I-, I think he looks like me. Well, I should hope not. <laughs> Emily, be a dear, and let me hold him. All right, Emily. You want to collect your bet from Williams, Father? First thing in the morning. Five thousand of it's yours, anyhow. And with the other five, I'm making over shares of the stars and stripes to my grandson here. Oh, you hear that, Master Blake? He can talk, so I'll thank you for him, Father. Come on, let's go up to the house. You can tell us all about the vibe. Well, Father, as far as go, it's pretty quiet. Nothing much happened. <laughs> From Bath, Maine to Hong Kong, and from Boston to California, New York to Sydney, and Baltimore to Cape Town. So during that colorful era sailed the stately clippers with wet salt on their sails, their holes full of grain and gold, spices, silk, and tea. And so it was that the greatest fleet of sailing vessels the world has ever seen carried the American flag and American commerce into every port of the oceans of the world. The American Clipper Ship. And now here's Basil Rysdale speaking for the DuPont Company with a story from the wonder world of chemistry. Have you ever had a longing to see the queer sights in distant corners of the world? To sail your own snug little craft into the harbors of Singapore, Sydney, Cape Town, and Constantinople? With a favoring breeze to coast past towering Sugarloaf as you make for Rio de Janeiro? 
To fascinating ports like those, our story of chemistry takes us tonight. Aboard the trim, white, two-masted schooner Yankee, famous for two round-the-world trips with amateur crews of adventurers and due for another such trip this year. In many an out-of-the-way harbor, queer craft have swarmed about the Yankee and natives have touched her sleek, glistening hull, jabbering strange words of admiration. For part of the beauty of this smart schooner is the new Marine Dulux finish, a finish that keeps it sparkling white in spite of the hard wear given by ocean waves, salt spray, and harbor gases. And Dulux, born in DuPont Research Laboratories, is one of chemistry's recent contributions to better living. Not merely a finish for ships that sail the seven seas, whether they be huge ocean liners or tiny pleasure craft, but also for homes like yours and mine. In fact, the whole story of modern paints and finishes is one that does credit to the chemist's skill and patient research. You've heard of wheat farms and potato farms. Have you ever heard of DuPont's paint farms? Let me describe one to you. Maybe you'll recognize it when you're out motoring. In a large field stand rows and rows of panels fixed on frames in a slanting position. One of these paint farms contains about 30,000 panels, each of them coated with a paint or finish. White, red, black, green, yellow, such a variety of hues that Joseph's coat of many colors would look drab beside them. Probably 15,000 different variations of formula and color are tested there at one time. Exposed to burning sun, driving rain, snow and ice, and wind-driven dust. Careful records are kept, and each finish has to be good enough to beat Mother Nature at her worst before it's considered good enough for your house, your refrigerator, your furniture, your automobile, and scores of other things you use daily. And since paint has to meet climatic conditions in all parts of the United States, one paint farm isn't enough. DuPont has nine of them scattered in widely separated parts of the country, from Texas to Massachusetts, California to Michigan. They even have a paint farm on a rooftop in a big city. Yes, paint. Such a common material, you seldom give it a thought. But without paint, wood would rot, iron would rust, and man's handiwork wouldn't last very long. It helps make the world a cleaner place to live in and adds the joy of color. What the research chemist has done to improve paint is well expressed by the DuPont pledge, better things for better living through chemistry. <laughs> Next week, the Cavalcade of America presents a colorful story about the great Indian Empire of the Iroquois Longhouse. So until next week, then, at this same time, this is Thomas Chalmers saying good night and best wishes from Japan. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System.